Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on Him was laid, here in the death of Christ I lay. life this morrow Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three day prison Our faith had been in vain But now is Christ the risen the risen the risen But now is Christ the risen Has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. Mother of souls from ill, my passing soul delivered. Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now is Christ a Christ 
shall rest and for a season slumber Till Trump from east to west shall wake the dead in number Had Christ who once was slain that first his three day prison Our faith had been in vain But now is Christ the risen Hi everyone, we miss you. Have a happy Easter. What do you want to say? Hi friends, I miss you. Bye. What are you going to say, Bubba? What are you going to tell them? Bye, was Jesus a lamb. What did Jesus a lamb do? On Easter, they rolled a stone away. Love you. Can't wait to Bye. see you. Bye. Bye. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning. Welcome everyone to Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Thousand Oaks, California. I'm Pastor Noah Bader, privileged to serve you again this morning in another one of our online worship services for the second Sunday of Easter. Thank you to everyone who submitted a picture or a video of how you spent last Easter Sunday. Even though we're apart, I think it's great for us to be able to see one another and to, to know that we're all doing well and that we were all gathered around God's word and rejoicing in his victory over sin and death together. Our Easter joy continues today on this second Sunday of Easter as we meet Jesus who appears to his group of disciples for the very first time that Easter Sunday evening. And where does he find them? behind locked doors, huddled in their homes for, out of fear of what was going on out there. Sound familiar? Jesus comes and he brings them his word of peace. And that's what Jesus is going to bring us this morning, his peace and his presence through his living and enduring word. The order of service that will follow can be found, uh, the link is down below the video here in the, the, the notes um, on our YouTube channel. Uh, take a look at it if you want to follow along. I'll put up most of everything on the screen um, that uh, will involve your participation. I um, invite you to do that as you're comfortable at home in the hymns and the, the scripture readings that we'll, we'll join in speaking together. May the living Lord be with us and bless us this morning to strengthen our faith and to glorify his name. We'll begin with our opening hymn.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God has made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy for patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us, that we may live for you. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. 
O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 2. The Apostle Peter testifies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact, the word of the Lord. Our psalm for the day is Psalm 16. The verses we just heard Peter proclaim about King David and the resurrected Jesus. Please join in reading the words in bold type. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Our second scripture reading is recorded in St. Peter's first epistle, chapter 1. These words will serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, 
who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel appointed for the second Sunday of Easter is recorded in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, a, a glimmer of hope. I, I guess that's what you could say. We were given this week, were we not? Various multi-step plans as to how to open the country back up again. Uh, different trends and charts showing that the curve is maybe starting to flatten out a bit. Actual dates given by states and cities as to when non-essential businesses and employees might even be able to go back to work. Even carefully crafted statements hinting at the idea that life getting back to normal might even be in sight. Oh, but, but hope, even a glimmer of hope, man, that can be a dangerous thing, can it? Isn't that something we've all had to learn in this life? We even have to learn it in our childhood. Mom or dad promised to, to take you somewhere or to do or buy you something special. And then we get our hopes up only to be met with those disappointing words, eh, not today. And, and as we get older, our hopes only grow exponentially bigger. Now we're not hoping for a trip or for a gift. Now we're hoping for things like a successful career or a lifelong marriage or a healthy family, a beautiful home we can afford, a strong portfolio, and, and we're teased even because there are certain times in our lives when we convince ourselves we've actually achieved those things. And then something like this happens and our hopes come to a screeching halt. And even for the most optimistic of us, and that, that pessimism rises up inside of us as we're reminded that hope, even a glimmer of hope, can be a dangerous thing. You know, no one was hoping for Jesus to be alive more than Peter. Just think back to how things ended between Peter and Jesus. A couple of weeks after telling Jesus that he would rather die on a cross than having to watch Jesus suffer and die, well, the time came. Jesus was the one who had to carry and ultimately die on his cross alone. After vehemently rejecting Jesus' prediction that Peter would deny Jesus, Peter does it later that same night. And, and maybe even only just a couple hours after Peter cut off one of the ears of a guard who tried to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, showing his fearless commitment to Jesus, well, Peter fled outside Jesus' courtroom and hid with all the rest. Any way you slice it, Peter had failed Jesus. His big moment of testing had come and he failed. His heart was crushed and his hope was lost. I mean, how do you reconcile with your best friend after they've died? How do you continue to be hopeful when the one you had put your hope in is gone? It had been three days since all of that had happened, and there Peter sat with the rest of the disciples hiding behind locked doors, with a dead Jesus on their mind and dead hope in their hearts. When all of a sudden Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Before Peter could even get out of his mouth, all of his failures and all of the ways that he had sinned against Jesus, before he could get any of them out, they were forgiven. 
Though Peter had completely failed Jesus, Jesus would not fail Peter. With one simple word, a word of peace, Peter's life and his heart and his hope were restored. Peter wrote his first epistle, his first letter, the the words from which our second scripture reading were taken. He wrote that letter nearly 30 years after that first Easter Sunday. And he begins it in what I think we would consider sort of an unusual way. Peter opens his letter with a eulogy for Jesus. Now, a eulogy is something that we typically don't write for someone until after they've died, but Peter waited 30 years to write one for Jesus after he rose. That's the first word of our text, actually, in the original Greek. The first word there is eulogy. It literally means a good word. And that's how Peter begins. He says, praise be to God. Literally, a eulogy for God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Though three decades had passed, Peter sounds like he's still standing in front of Jesus, examining his hands and his side. Thirty years could do nothing to subdue his rejoicing. Thirty years had gone by, but you could never tell it by reading these words from Peter. You also can't tell by simply reading the English but in the, original languages, uh, in the original language, these seven verses, verses 3 through 9, it's one long sentence. Peter is so eager to share this inexpressible joy that he has that he can't even stop to mark a period or catch his breath. He's like a kid on Christmas morning talking to his grandma on the phone, trying to explain to her all of the amazing things that he's just opened. The man who once failed Jesus so miserably now cannot stop gushing God's praise. Because you see, Peter wasn't just given a second chance to patch things up with Jesus or to try and do better this time around. Peter recognized it for what it was. Jesus being alive meant that Peter had a whole new life. He calls it a new birth. And he wasn't just given a a glimmer of hope in something that could fade away or die altogether tomorrow. Jesus' resurrection gave him a living hope because it was tied to a living Savior. And what Peter learned behind those locked doors is what you and I need to learn behind ours this morning. That your hope, much like your faith, is only as good as the thing in which it's put. If your hope is in the world's greatest economy, watch as it comes crashing down seemingly overnight. If your hope is in your career, what happens when someone else labels your career as non-essential and tells you to go home? If your hope is in your health, how in all the world will you protect it when the thing trying to attack you is something you can't even see? If your hope is in a president or a governor to protect you, What happens when they make the wrong decision? Or they make the right decision, but they make it too too late. If your hope is in a stay-at-home order to save you, what will you do when no one else obeys it? We're so eager to put our hope in things that will only fail us in the end. And when your hope is placed in perishable things, then please do not be surprised when your hope perishes with them. But do you hear how Peter contrasts all of that with the new birth and the living hope you've been given in a resurrected Jesus Christ? 
who gives you an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh, did you hear how important those two things are to God? First, He promises to protect your eternal inheritance. Peter says it's being kept in heaven for you, which means it's more safe, it's more fail-proof than the biggest businesses and the most powerful banks in the world. And he promises to protect you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until that inheritance is handed over to you. And you say, ah, but there it is. If God promises to shield me, then why is all of this happening? Aside from being locked in my home, I haven't felt very shielded lately, God. You're suffering. And and Peter understood suffering too. After Jesus ascended into heaven, Peter's life really only got more difficult. He was in and out of prison for preaching the resurrected Jesus. He was chased from town to town, and ultimately, the prediction that he made to Jesus came true. He would be crucified like Jesus as he died on his own cross, martyred for his faith. Peter doesn't deny that suffering will happen in the Christian's life. And anyone, even a pastor or the strongest, best believer you've ever met, if they tell you anything otherwise, they're lying to you. No, instead, Peter says, in this inheritance, in this salvation, in this new birth, in this living hope, you greatly rejoice. Though... Now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And and even though that little while of suffering can seem like a lifetime, it isn't. And even though those trials can seem like a life sentence, they aren't. You see, with the picture of the resurrected and living Lord standing in front of him, with that picture seared into his mind and into his heart, Peter finally has perspective. He now understands that Jesus didn't die and rise to make your life easier or less painful. Jesus died and rose to make your life eternal. And with that eternal perspective, And with his living hope, Peter now understands why pain and suffering and trials come our way. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Money and gold perish. Careers and jobs perish. Governments perish. And along with them, all hope that is placed in them. But by faith in Jesus Christ, you and your inheritance and the hope that you have in that same Jesus Christ who won that inheritance for you, those things will never perish. Friends, even if you, like Peter in the face of his suffering, have flunked your test of faith recently, if you have turned your back on and deserted your Savior, if you have wandered from the faith or wavered under worldly pressure, if you are filled with regret over misplaced hope, hear Jesus' word of peace this morning and know that he speaks it to you. Peace be with you. He died to remove your sin and guilt forever 
and now he lives to restore you. He has returned from death to return you to himself. He seeks to shower you with his love and forgiveness, though you have faltered. Jesus has not. And though you feel hopeless, you are not. Because in Jesus, you have a living Savior who has given you a living hope. No, Christ's resurrection will not free you from an economic recession or promise you a job. His resurrection won't make you numb to what it feels like to to lose a loved one or provide you with a perfect marriage or even spare you from physical suffering. Jesus' resurrection doesn't mean that you won't have to experience pain in this life. It means that none of those pains will defeat you. Jesus' resurrection won't let them because your hope is not in them. Your life is not built on them any longer. In Jesus Christ, you have a whole new life with a living hope. Which is why, even though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Everything. Everything we experience in this life, good and bad, will pale in comparison to the eternal joy and comfort your risen Lord will one day reveal to you. Thirty years couldn't stop Peter. And I pray a lifetime will not stop you from rejoicing over that fact either. It really is no shock that Peter writes so eagerly, with so much joy, why he can't even seem to lift his pen from the paper. And it should not seem strange that despite being locked in our homes yet again this week, you and I cannot stop singing our alleluias. Peter gave up everything to follow Jesus, and because of the resurrection, Jesus proved it was not a waste. And when this life is over for you, and your suffering has ended, Jesus will prove to you that it was not a waste for you either. In this life, hope, even a glimmer of hope, it can be a dangerous thing, but not when it's placed in a living Jesus. That hope will sustain you and guard you and shield you until that day when you finally receive the goal of your faith, the very salvation of your soul. God grant it. Amen. We join in the prayer of the church. Let us pray. God of all grace, By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, you have given us assurance that our faith stands upon a true and sure foundation. We thank you for the inexpressible gift of eternal life in your Son. Grant us your Spirit, so that our hearts may rest firmly in this truth. Shield us by your power. Preserve and defend us from all assaults on our souls, so that we hold fast to the confession of our faith. Deliver us from doubt and despair. Save us from worldly wisdom and false learning. We lift our hearts in thanksgiving for your holy word. Grant that we may be illumined by its heavenly light and instructed by its saving truth. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us to see him with the eyes of faith. Lead us to love him and rejoice in him and grant that we may receive the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Breathe upon your church, so that we faithfully preach your word 
and proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people. Forgive the sins of your people, strengthen the doubting and the faithless, bring back the forgetful and wayward, comfort the anxious and the distressed. As we begin our week, give us peace and joy, even if suffering awaits. Finally, bring us to the inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.